Hello everyone, this is the sixth video in our series of tutorials regarding the EM solver and the decurrents. This video will talk about a special feature of the EM solver, namely the axisymmetric solver. So in this video we'll assume that you already have a good knowledge of eddy currents uh, and how to use the EM solver for metal forming applications. Uh, if not, I highly recommend that you check uh, some of the previous videos. In the previous parts, uh, we saw that a typical metal forming application involved a coil and a workpiece, and that the FEM BEM method used by the EM solver made the runs robust and accurate. And we really insisted upon the fact that the BEM matrices, um, you know, I took time assembling them, they were the driving cost of the analysis, and made the EM runs not computationally cheap. We also saw some techniques that reduced the size of those BEM matrices. However, one thing which had not yet, which you know, we hadn't yet remarked upon, uh, was the fact that this case, uh, this particular case, which uh, we usually worked with, um, it, that it exhibited a particular feature which is sometimes encountered in metal forming applications, um, but mo more importantly, which is uh, very often encountered uh, in tube expansion problems. We have a near perfect axisymmetry. You know, the workpiece is completely axisymmetric, for example. And then why do I say uh, near perfect? Um, well, that's because of the coil. The winding of the coil will cause some 3D effects, uh, but we'll see later that uh, they can perhaps be neglected. And thus, you know, for such problems, uh, it might be interesting to switch to an axisymmetric solver. The axisymmetric feature in the EM solver has been developed in order to simplify certain types of cases and uh, in order to save some calculation time. But you know, since Celestina is primarily a 3D code, uh, where most of the features are available in 3D, it was decided that the most convenient way to proceed was to couple EM 2D with Dyna 3D. In other words, uh, and this is what we're going to see in the next slides, uh, we'll see that the user needs to still provide a slice of the 3D mesh, uh, as well as a segment set in the plane where the EM2D is done. Once the EM2D fields are computed, uh, they are simply reported over the full 3D mesh by rotations around the axis. Then uh, it's the same thing. Coupling with uh, thermal and solid mechanical solvers uh, always happens and it's automatic. Um, now the main feature of the axisymmetric solver is that it's very fast compared to the equivalent 3D analysis. And in some cases, since it gives you know, a quick and good approximation of the solution, it can be a good replacement when investigating certain effects such as using a higher frequency current or you know, moving the coil around. Uh, those cases where uh, you need many runs and you need a quick answer and uh, for those you know, in order to optimize certain parameters and for this uh, the axisymmetric solver might be uh, a good answer. So keyword and mesh setup wise, how to proceed? Well, the first keyword that the user needs to define is EM rotation axis, where the user specifies, well, a rotation axis uh, for the EM2D solve. Then, for each axisymmetric part, a user defined ratio of the full circle mesh has to be built, basically a slice uh, of a cake. But the angle of that slice uh, needs to be a power of 2. For example, the user can define a fourth of a circle, or an eighth, or a sixteenth. Or, uh, you know, such as uh, in, in this case, what you see there below, a 32th of the full 360 degree circle. This is the point of the new sec flag, which you see below. Then the user needs to define a segment at the center of that slice, uh, which will be where the EM fields uh, will be computed. And he needs to define a start segment set and an end segment set, so the solver knows where to report the fields. He then puts all this information in the EM underscore 2D axis keyword. Each slice will need to be associated with such a keyword. Next comes the question of the coil. How to model it? Well, the first point is that each winding uh, of the coil will be a separate part with its own circuit and its own EM underscore 2D axis keyword. This means that we will of course neglect the 3D effects of the helicoidal coil. This is what you see below, the difference between the 3D coil and the equivalent uh, 2D coil which is set up. But uh, you know, how to define our RLC circuits uh, in such a coil, in such a setup? Uh, RLC circuits are perhaps the most common type of circuits uh, for such metal forming applications. 
Well, luckily, uh, it's also possible in the EM solver to impose a linear constraint on the global current between two circuits. This allows the user to basically say that the current that comes out of, the, of one circuit uh, is the same current uh, which needs to come in in the next circuit, and so forth. So he can set up um, you know, independent RLC circuits and then connect them all. Pay attention though, uh, the values taken by RLC for each circuit cannot be the same as for the 3D circuit. Rather, each winding will have a portion uh, of the total 3D circuit. So in order to get the best results, the user can spread ev evenly the R, L and C values over each winding for each circuit. So again, in summary, for the coil, once the user has defined a circuit and a 2D axi part for each winding and associated to each part a portion of the R, L, C circuit values, he can then connect those circuits together by using the keyword EM circuit connect. In the example below, he will, for example, have four circuits because he's got four windings and will therefore need to define the EM circuit connect keyword three times, thus connected all those connecting sorry, all those circuits together. So this is how you set up your coil and RLC circuit with the EM axis metric solver. So here from the website, from the Dyna examples website, uh, we downloaded this axisymmetric case, uh, which is the same as our metal forming uh, problem, which we had seen before, but this time uh, it uses the axisymmetric solver. So uh, there's just a couple of things which uh, I would like to show to you. You see here the coil, we've done, you know, those six parts uh, for the, you know, the six windings of the 3D coil. Um, if uh, you as a user would like to add uh, another winding, uh, there's several ways to do that in this pre-post. Uh, I'm just going to show you one, for example. Here, um, you could define, you know, four points uh, for your middle surface. Uh, let's go, let me just create those real quick. After creating those four points, you could connect them, uh, you know, with by creating a line. Okay. Uh, then you could here, if you go in the uh, surf option, you could create a plane, which you could then mesh into a new part. And then since you need uh, to create a solid, you could go here, where is my uh, in element tool, and then go into element generate. No, it's in mesh, sorry, it's here. Yeah, there we go. And then do a shell spin option. Okay, and then spin around the z-axis in order to have something like this. Okay, then you'd go on the other, the other direction and you have something like this. Okay, then you could move those parts, those two parts, into uh, just one part, and then just delete, you know, part number nine, the shell which you use to create uh, the other two. This is just one way of proceeding. There's many other, uh, many other options in this pre-post, uh, but this is uh, just one method in order to create uh, those parts. A couple of other things uh, that I'd like you to uh, pay attention to. Uh, on the solid side, uh, you also need to specify the correct boundary conditions. So um, you need to define, if you go here in the keyword section, you need to define uh, coordinate nodes uh, to define a local reference frame so you can define uh, the correct boundary condition on this um, local reference frame on both you know, the two uh, faces here, on the two sides of your axisymmetric part here. Okay, uh, this is on the structural side. Uh, next, uh, if we take a look uh, at the electromagnetic uh, input deck uh, that we have here, uh, let's see what we can see here. The first thing to note is that, uh, as you know, as we saw before earlier, is that the parameters for the RLC circuit are not the same as for the 3D run. They are divided uh, by the number of windings of the coil. Okay, so they divide by six. And then they are all associated to six circuits, one for each of those windings. Okay, so we have uh, six circuits here. And then since we have six circuits and we want to connect them together, uh, it means that we have five times the keyword EM circuit connect that we have here. Okay. Um, then we have a rotation axis, uh, that's fairly simple. Uh, and then for each axisymmetric part, so in this case we have the workpiece and uh, our six turns of the coil, uh, we have one EM underscore 2D axis keyword. 
One thing also to uh, pay attention to uh, real quick is pay attention to the normals uh, of the segment set uh, in the middle there. So uh, if um, we take a look at the, for example, here on the workpiece, uh, this uh, segment set ID number three, uh, and if I, and then we have one and two, I think here on the, on the two sides, and then if I display, the normals, okay, uh, it has to be uh, in good accordance with what you have specified as a rotation axis uh, and in the EM uh, circuit keyword as well, so pay attention to that. In this case it's correct because uh, we have segments at 1, which then goes through 3, okay, and the normals are in the, in the correct direction, and then to 2, okay. And if you take a look at EM to the axis, okay, start is 1, goes uh, through 3, and then exits at 2. And it's the same thing in the EM circuit keyword here. Uh, well, of course, I picked the, the workpiece uh, rather than one of the coils, but uh, you get the idea. Okay, this is uh, how to specify your input there correctly for the 2D axisymmetric solver. And then uh, in this specific case, uh, it's pretty obvious that you have a huge gain. Uh, if you remember in the previous video, we said that uh, the full 3D run took about uh, 15 minutes. So this one here, it's got an equivalent mesh. If you look at the message file, uh, it takes about 10 seconds, okay? So 15 minutes versus 10 seconds, uh, here the gain is pretty obvious. And then if you animate it, uh, you'll see that the results uh, are fairly similar in terms of displacement uh, compared to the 3D run. And the small discrepancies uh, that, you know, you will uh, see uh, are due to the fact that in the 3D run, uh, well, you know, it's not completely equivalent or completely the same for the coil, the geometry, um, as for the 2D axisymmetric case. So if we sum up what we have seen here, uh, the axisymmetric solver has been developed for eddy current problems that admit a symmetry in the theta direction. It is possible to impose a linear constraint on circuits, uh, which, you know, for the axisymmetric solver means that it's possible to simulate helix or spiral coils combined with RLC circuits. We have then introduced three new keywords, one for the rotation axis, one for each axisymmetric EM part, and then one in order to connect the different circuits together. And then uh, one of the key features of the axisymmetric solver is that it offers a significant speed up in terms of calculation time compared to the equivalent 3D problem. This is what you see below. Here you see uh, on the left there, you see uh, the differences between uh, the 3D run and the 2D axisymmetric, 15 minutes uh, versus 9 seconds. And then on the right here, you see some results uh, in terms of, of displacements, um, you know, at the, at the location, the, the highest um, deformation point. And you'll see there that uh, the differences are just a couple of percent. So very minor uh, differences. Okay. So again, I thank you for watching this video and I hope to see you uh, for the next one.